for joining us for the study and formulating committee for November 12th, 2020. Um, and I kind of, I'll lead this on to uh, Ms. Holliday, if you'd like to start off. Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm glad that we all were able to be a part of this morning's committee meeting. Justin, will you call roll please? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll call everyone's name if you could unmute and respond here. Trish Holliday. Here. Cleo Rucker. Here. here. Nick Brassel. Here. Richard Chapman. Here. And Kim Stagg. Present. Thank you. We have uh, full attendance today. All right, uh, moving on, uh, Nikki, if you can read the electronic uh, meeting statement. This is Nikki Eke. In accordance with the governor's executive order, before considering items on the agenda, the committee needs to determine by roll call vote that the meeting agenda constitutes essential business of the committee and that meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. So the committee can just go ahead and entertain a motion and a second uh, to take action on this issue. Committee, do I have a motion? This is Dick Chapman. I move we meet electronically. This is Trish Holiday. I second. All right. If everyone, I'll uh, do a roll call. Trish Holiday. Uh, yes. Cleo Rucker. Cleo Rucker? You say yes. Yes. Thank you. Nick Brassel? Yes. Richard Chapman? Yes. And Kim Stagg? Yes. Thank you. The motion is approved. This is Nikki Eke. The only other general announcements are that um, under the governor's executive order number 65, each time any person who is using audio only participation wishes to speak, he or she shall identify themselves in a manner reasonably calculated to permit the public to ascertain the identity of the person speaking. And then the final uh, announcement is that all votes during the meeting shall be by roll call. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, this is Justin Stack again. Uh, first item of business is the uh, minutes from the October 30th, 2020 meeting. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, we do not have the minutes uh, available uh, to bring to the committee. So I apologize. We will have that available at the next committee for your approval, if that's all right. That's fine. And Justin, this is Trish Holiday. Question, uh, just curious as to where they are. Uh, I believe that the minutes haven't been drafted yet. Uh, so I think that's something that uh, we are currently working on uh, from the, uh, the, the recordings, uh, putting the minutes together and drafting them and be able to present them. So I think that's where we're, we're unable to provide at this time. Okay, thank you for that explanation and appreciate it. And I think we're good. Thank you. All right. Uh, Moving on, this is Justin Stack again. Uh, we will, uh, if it's all right, uh, Ms. Holiday, we'll move on to the first item of business, uh, which is the review of the 2012 vesting in OPEC changes. Uh, yes. have, thank you. We have Christy Mayo uh, from uh, Metro Human Resources here to the first question. Um, good morning. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Okay, can everyone see it? 
Okay, so um, let's talk about the changes that the 2012 study and formulating committee recommended to the board. Um, there were five benefit changes and um, these changes um, impacted employees that were hired on or after January the 1st of 2013 or employees that were rehired on or after um, January 1st of 2013 who had not vested before they left employment. Employees that were vested or were hired prior to 2013 are not under these new rules. So it really impacts just employees that were hired on or after January of 2013 or those that were rehired that weren't vested. Okay, let me, okay. So the first change dealt with pension plan vesting. From 2001 to 2012, the vesting requirement was five years, but the um, board changed the vesting based upon the study and formulating recommendation, and they moved it to 10-year vesting for service pension qualification and survivor benefits. The second change dealt with insurance eligibility at retirement. Employees are eligible to keep the medical, dental, and vision benefits at retirement as long as they are immediately eligible to take an early or normal service pension, even if they choose to defer their pension to their unreduced retirement date, and as long as they have 10 years of service. Prior to 2013, retirees were allowed to retain their medical and dental coverage regardless of how much pension credited service they had earned during their employment. The third change deals with retiree medical premiums and these premiums are indexed based upon the amount of pension credited service that the eligible retiree has earned throughout their career with Metro. Before 2013, the retiree premium share was 25% regardless of the length of service that the member had. And this chart shows you how um, those premiums are indexed. So if you have at least 10 years, but you don't quite have 15 years of service, the pensioner is gonna pay 75% of their medical premium. If you have, let's say, 18 to 19 years of credited service, the member is going to pay 35% of that premium. So as you can see, the more credited service that they earn, the less of the uh, medical premium contribution the member will pay. And if they have 20 years or more of service, they're going to pay 25%. And of course, Metro would pay the remaining 75%. And one thing to note is that disability pensioners and survivors of disability pensioners still have that 75-25 split. And the fourth change deals with pensioners who want to opt out or back into Metro's insurance plans. Service and survivor pensioners who had not previously opted out of Metro's plans beginning um, in 2013 could opt out with proof of other non-Medicare coverage and preserve their right to opt back into the plan within 60 days of an eligible change in status. Prior to 2013, if a pensioner opted out of Metro's coverage, then they were not allowed to re-enroll for any reason into the medical or dental plans. So as long as that pensioner has proof of other non-Medicare coverage, we will allow them to opt out and preserve their right to opt back into the plan. And the last change um, is regarding the salary supplement program. Um, this program was expanded in 2013 um, and it gave additional resources for all benefit eligible active employees who are deemed disabled from their current position by the board 
to have um, a supplement of their earnings um, if they can perform the duties of another but lesser paying job. So this program allows employees to remain at work rather than going on a disability pension. And prior to 2013, the salary supplement program was only for disability pensioners who returned to work. So the program was expanded um, to include active employees in that salary supplement. So these are the only, cha the only changes that we have. There were five changes. And um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in case anyone has any questions regarding the presentation. Thank you so much. Hold on a second. Hold on. I had to figure out how to unmute me. This is Dick Chapman. I had a couple questions. Okay. On the insurance eligibility rules that deal with um, you got to have 10 years of service to continue, that's retirement credit. That's not necessarily participation in this plan. Um, the 10 years deals with pension credited service. So when we calculate your pension, um, you will be given credited service uh, based upon your employment with Metro. And so it's based on your pension credited service, which those rules are a little bit different than um, the civil service rules are for earning vacation, um, sick leave, things like that. But it's retirement credit so that, let's say for the sake of argument, somebody had a HIPAA qualifying event two years prior to their termination of employment for the purpose of retirement. And they then enrolled in the insurance plan, but they had, for the sake of argument, 20 years of service for the retirement plan, but only two years in the health insurance. They would be paying their premium based on their 20 years of service with Metro, not their two years in the plan. That is, that's correct. If I understand, Ginger, y'all understand that question? Um, yes, so they're, whether they were enrolled in the plan or not for the full employment period, is that what you're asking, Mr. Chapman? Yes. Okay. Because yes. in some instances, they may have, they may have been covered by a spouse who had health insurance, right. who terminated his or her employment, therefore creating a qualifying event because they lost coverage. Right. And then they can enroll in the plan. Pre-existing right. conditions are waived. Right. And in turn, they would be in the plan for the sake of argument in this example for two years, but they would be paying a premium into the plan as if they were a 20-year participant in the plan. Yes. Correct. Oh, no. Participant in the plan at that in this example doesn't matter because that's not the way Metro measures it. It's measured based upon your credited service that you earned towards your pension. So if they were employed for 10 years or 15 years, then their um, medical premium their price is going to be yeah. based on that service. Okay. Not, not how long they were in the health insurance plan. Okay. And that applies for both the eligibility stuff and also for the premium tiering. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. And that, that gets back to a question about, in some places, insurance and retirement are separate items. They were separate where I worked in the state government, completely separate from each other. They aren't separate in Metro because they have the same governing body that basically sets them up. Yes, the Metro Code outlines eligibility for benefits, so they are not separate animals like, like you're explaining with the state. Okay. Thank you. Christy, I, I, I have a basic question. Um, do, do your materials apply to 
every Metro employee or only Metro employees that are not firefighters, not police, anybody at teachers, anybody else this doesn't apply to? So um, what we covered actually applies to all um, classified employees, that is police and fire, that's general government employees, um, that is support staff at um, Metro schools, but it does not include the certificated employees at schools, which are teachers and principals. So it includes everyone else in Metro. This is Nick Brazel. This is just a very basic question. Um, so prior to 2001, was there no vesting requirement? Prior to, this is Christy Mayo again, prior to 2001, the vesting requirement was 10 years. Um, beginning in October of 2001, it was actually lowered from 10 years to five years. And then in 2013, went back up to the 10 year requirement. Okay, thank you. This is Trish Holiday. Hey, Christy, why, what was the, why did we go back to 10 years? Um, I think it was a matter of um, just the cost of that benefit. Um, Shannon or um, Ginger might be able to give a better explanation, but I think it was the sheer cost of having a five-year vesting requirement because mm -hmm. it not only was for the employee, but if, if I as an active employee had five years of service and I passed away as an active employee, my spouse, my legal spouse or children would continue to get that benefit. So it, it was a, a cost issue. Mm -hmm. And Madam Chair, uh, speaking to that point, um, uh, I had the pleasure of supporting in a different role at Metro HR, the 2012 study and formulating committee. I definitely think that it was certainly uh, mindful towards the eye that five years was a very low vesting period, very unusually low. Um, that 10 years was more of a standard, um, certainly one that I think long term Metro had been accustomed to. But I do not, I think it's also worth mentioning that the committee certainly had an eye towards uh, OPEB at that point, right? The Government Accounting Standards Board had started um, their accounting changes in 2008. So by the time the 2012 Study and Formulating Committee started studying, they were certainly quite mindful of OPEB and that that would be a growing liability. So if you notice, there were a couple of things that Christy covered. One, obviously, you're going to have twice as many people probably vest at five versus 10 years. So, and for us here at Metro, you're not eligible for retiree medical at all, which is OPEB. You're not eligible for that unless you're eligible for a pension. So uh, not when you move to the 10-year vesting, you have half as many people likely qualifying not only for the pension, but that future OPEB, that was number one. Number two, another thing that Christy uh, pointed out is that that tiered scale of retiree cost share for that medical insurance coverage as well, right? So uh, prior to the 2013 legislation and those recommendations that com came from this committee, uh, you could vest for a full pension at five years, and you could have retiree health coverage at 75% paid by Metro. Now, you've not only cut part of the population that's gonna vest and be eligible for that OPEB retiability, that uh, OPEB liability, that person that's vesting at 10 years now also has to pay, so they have to pay the 75%, not Metro. So these collection of strategies were meant to be a little bit more in line with pro, like more normal vesting requirements for pension, but certainly accounted for um, what was becoming a growing OPEB liability to help address the term I had used back then was kind of stop the bleeding a bit and to scale back part of the of how big that liability was. So they the board, the study and formally committee recommended the board and the council to pretty meaningful steps in that legislation to not only set appropriate pension vesting requirements, but also start to address that uh, growing OPEB liability, if that makes any sense. 
Yes, I appreciate that context. I'm curious because, and I was really curious about that context because how it relates to recruitment and retention. And I just, there are several different thoughts around when somebody can best at five, you have an opportunity to retain. And if that's not really an issue that isn't that Metro's dealing with, I totally get the stop the bleeding approach. So I'm just, I was just curious because 10, like I have a, uh, my son works for Metro and he loves it. Uh, but he always says to me, I can't be vested till 10 years. And I'm like, well, hang in there, right? Um, I just, uh, from a state perspective, we had five. So I was just curious as the context of that, because I think that's important messaging to your employees as to why it's 10. I think that's a really good point. I do think that was, and this was prior to my time, but my understanding is that lowering that vesting period to five years was part of a recruitment strategy at that time. So on the flip side of it, I think um, the general rule of thought was, you know, we can address a number of things, right? A more appropriate vesting period that's not completely out of line with similarly situated peers. Let's reward long-term employment with Metro. So, you know, the other, the flip side of um, the recruitment tool is if you make the vesting period to 10, right, still attainable, it could be a retention strategy, right? So that maybe after those first four, five, six, seven years of employment, now all of a sudden the employee is like, do I stay? And they kind of want to stay because they want to get. And so hopefully we can also be using that 10-year vesting as our retention tool. Um, so right now I think um, while there are certain populations that are always going to be hard to recruit and obviously the economy is such that that's just going to be the case especially for I think metro Nashville area um, I think it's been more towards an eye towards rewarding long-term service to metro employees and using it as a retention tool for the employees that we do hire yeah I appreciate that this is Trish Holiday I appreciate that context and I would just encourage them um, you know, hoping that that messaging of encouragement and long term, uh, we really want you to be a part of this, is communicated to to employees. This is Dick Chapman. Um, I have a question related to that. Moving from five year to ten year vesting for the purpose of the contribution towards retirement. Does anybody have any recollection as to what the impact was on the retirement plan contribution rate? for that change. I would say that probably starts to spill into possibly one of the upcoming uh, item discussions with um, Kevin. Oh Sullivan. yeah, we're gonna have the expert. We'll just grill them. Hopefully, yeah, I'm gonna say hopefully <laughs> some of that historical context will start to play out a bit because I think that's a really good question, Mr. Chapman. If you'd like, I can go ahead and address that question, maybe before we get into the, the full material that I have prepared. A at the time, moving from a, a five-year vesting to a 10-year vesting was expected to be a relatively small cost savings for the plan because at the time, wasn't a significant number of folks who, who uh, left work with Metro somewhere between five and 10 years. And those folks tended to be quite a bit younger. Um, the probably a greater savings was uh, expected to, uh, or a greater um, greater savings in going from five to 10 was likely on the OPEV side because those costs tend to be much higher for short service employees. Uh, so that's, that's where more of the cost savings were on the OPEV side as opposed to the pension side. Thank you so much, Mr. Sullivan. This is Trish Holiday. And Justin, I think we're ready to move to the next item on the agenda. Thank you. This is Justin Stack. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, moving on to item number two, review of pension funding and contribution rate setting. Uh, we have Kevin Sullivan, as you've already heard uh, from Finlay here to present. Okay, uh, this is Kevin Sullivan with Finley. Uh, hopefully you see the screen in front of you that has my presentation. Uh, let me know if you do not. Um, I have quite a bit of material prepared on the, the Metro Open Pension Plan, which is the, the large pension plan, the, the larger plan that uh, new participants come into. 
uh, over 12,000 active members and a similar number of retired and deferred vested members. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what's called the Guaranteed Payment Plan, which is an umbrella plan that was established about 20 years ago to cover five closed, frozen, relatively small and getting smaller plans that, that Metro still, uh, still deals with. So the topics I wanna cover is the purpose of the annual actuarial valuation that we perform, the annual plan contribution cost, uh, the current funded status and a little bit of history on what that funded status has been in, in, in the past decades. Uh, some comparisons with national studies, because I think this is a very important point of uh, a funded ratio by itself is not as meaningful unless you know how you compare to other cities, states, counties around the country. Uh, and then also a summary of the guaranteed payment plan, as I mentioned. Uh, so starting out, I wanna mention what is a fundamental pension fact, and that is, is that um, it's kind of where money comes from, where money goes. Uh, starting on the right, the benefit payments. These are the payments that are made to uh, retirees uh, and their beneficiaries after their service with Metro. And this is determined by the Metro code. It's determined by actual salaries and service histories that those members uh, per perform and earn over their, their, their career with Metro. Uh, also the participant actions, when they decide to retire, what form of payment they decide to take when they retire. Uh, and also in inflation, uh, the actual cost of living adjustments that retirees receive, uh, that is also, uh, that also drives benefit payments. Now on, so that's the cost of the plan, that's money going out. On the left, the two components are the source of funding for those benefits. And again, moving from, from left to right, the investment earnings, less fees, that is the money that the tr investment trust that's set aside to pay benefits earns over time. And that's determined by the investment allocation and market forces, which we all know those can be very, very volatile and, and are driven by many external forces, uh, but also fees paid by the, the trust in both investment and non-investment fees. Then the, the, for, from the actuary's perspective, the interesting component is the contributions. That's where we make a number of assumptions to determine what the contributions need to be so that when combined with investment earnings is sufficient to pay the benefits of the plan over the long term. Uh, and so that's determined based on a number of assumptions and that's assumptions about investment return. It's assumptions about how long folks live after they retire, uh, what inflation will be for cost of living adjustments, when folks will retire or when folks will separate from service before retirement. Uh, so all of those are assumptions that go into our process of determining what those contributions should be over time. And as you might imagine, uh, investment earnings is always a, a very significant component of this equation. So to the extent that investment earnings are not what we expected, so if investment earnings fall, that means over time contributions have to rise. And that's what many plans have seen uh, over the last decade or two. Also to the extent we're assuming less investment return over time, also contributions have to rise to, to fill that gap. Uh, so this, this equation is true for every pension plan and to the extent that um, plans are, are not putting in sufficient contributions over time, uh, the, the, plan, the government sponsoring those plans aren't putting in sufficient contributions, you begin to have problems with this equation. The, the, the money is not there to pay benefits as, as needed. So the annual valuation, the purpose of the valuation is to recommend a rate of pay to be contributed to the pension trust for the fiscal year, which is July 1 to June 30 for Metro. And we also measure the funded status of the plan. And this also creates the basis for some disclosures under the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. And that's shown in the, uh, the CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report that, that Metro produces each fall. Uh, and we also verify that the recommended rate satisfies the state minimum required contribution. And the state does have their own requirements. Uh, real quick, a couple of those are, you can't use a discount rate that it, or assumed investment return on assets uh, that's more than a half a percent lower than what the state uses. And right now we're using the exact same rate that the state uses, which is 7.25%. Uh, also there's, uh, you, you cannot uh, amortize any unfunded liability, and I'll get into those co concepts in a few moments, over a period longer than 30 years. So the state has some uh, fairly, um, fairly easy to, to uh, follow requirements in their, their funding rules. And when we look at how the contribution is determined, it is the sum of really three components. It's the cost of benefits earned during the current year by the 
active population with Metro. And that's, that's what we call the normal cost. And then there's a component for the amortization of any unfunded liability. And virtually all pension plans have unfunded liability. And that is basically liability for past service where there's not sufficient assets currently to cover that old liability. Uh, it's a little bit maybe maybe like the concept of a mortgage where you you have a balance and you're paying that off over time. Now, unlike a mortgage, it's it's never really uh, reasonable to expect that you'll pay it off and it will be gone forever because um, you're going to have gains and losses over time. Investment return won't be exactly what you expect for a year. People will retire differently than you expect. Salary increases will be different. Inflation will be different. And so even if you have a point in time where assets and liabilities are perfectly balanced, there's no unfunded liability, something will happen the next day and take you out of balance. You'll either be slightly underfunded or slightly overfunded. And the concept over time is, is that you're not really trying to eliminate that unfunded liability, but you're trying to keep it as small and manageable as possible. Now, when we look at desirable characteristics of a recommended contribution, we want to pay for the benefits as they are earned. And if we look at where governments around the country have gotten into trouble with their pension plans, that's one key area where they are not putting in enough money even to pay for the new benefits that are being earned. Because what that means is they're taking a, a, an existing problem, which is the plan's not sufficiently funded, and they're making it worse because they're not even putting in enough to cover the new benefits that are being added to the liability. So you want to pay for those benefits as they're earned. You also want to keep the plan well-funded. And well-funded can have different meanings to different groups of people. Some people will say 70% or more is well-funded because, as we'll talk about in a few moments, that puts you above the average for governmental plans in the U.S. Uh, I tend to think 80% or more is a better measure because, you, uh, frankly, if we look at the status of governmental plans all around the country, it's not a great picture. So you, you don't want to be average in a group that's not in great shape. You want to be well above average. So... 80% or more is, is better, and, and we've really in recent years, even 90% or more is considered a much better place to be. And as we'll talk about in a few moments, that's where Metro has been for much of the last 20 years. You also want your contributions to be reasonably level and be reasonably predictable. And a uh, key reason for that is government budgets tend to be uh, challenging and, and not very flexible, so you don't want your contribution rate to have a lot of volatility because uh, that creates challenges for budgeting purposes. So you want the contribution to be as level as possible and predictable as possible, which means if you know the contribution rate is going to rise over time or fall over time, we need to be communicating that as early as possible so that you have adequate time to plan for it. So a little briefly, some census information on the plan. This is comparing 2018 and 2019. There are two divisions in the uh, the active plan, the open Metro Open plan, and that dates back to about 1993. Uh, at that time, everyone was in Division A, and at that time, everyone was given the choice of staying in Division A or moving to Division B. And the vast majority did move to Division B. New employees go into Division B. Some very small differences between the benefits, cost of living adjustments, uh, disability benefits in those plans. Uh, but right now, the vast majority are in Division B. The, the Division A is a closed group, and as each of those folks retire, that, that division will go away. Uh, the compensation uh, covered by the plan, this is for the period ending June 30, 2019, was $638 million. Average compensation, uh, just under 54000 And we also have a population of retired members and beneficiaries, which is about 9,374 at June 30, 2019, and a group we call Deferred Vested. Now, this is, uh, this is when we're talking about the vested population in five years or 10 years vesting, this is that group we're talking about. These are folks who have separated from service with Metro. They haven't started their benefit yet, and in many cases aren't eligible to start their benefit yet, but they are due a benefit at a later time. Now, the, the full history on that, uh, the, the vesting, it, it was 10 years back many years ago, changed to five, and at that time, uh, the deferred vested population began to grow because we were having more of those folks who separated between five and 10 years adding to that population. Uh, more recently, it's been switched back from 10 to five. That population has, begin, has begun to stabilize, which it largely had already. We're reaching the point where 
each year many of those folks are reaching eligibility to start their benefits and do start their benefits and that's largely balancing out the folks who are who are now coming in so you'll see uh, that population actually declined very slightly from 2018 to 2019. Okay, on the next slide, slide seven, this is a picture of the liabilities of the plan as of June 30, 2019. It's what we cal calculate is the total liability, and this is the present value of all benefits expected to be earned or have been earned in the past by your retirees, beneficiaries, and deferred vested. Also, active, the liability earned today by your active population and also the liability expected to be earned in the future by your active population. And that number was 3.8 billion as of June 30, 2019. Now we break it down into several components. First, we look at that green portion, which is covered by the current assets of the plan. So this is liability that's fully funded by the trust fund, and that's 2.3 billion. That red bar represents a portion of past liability. This is again, past liability that is not covered by the plan assets. And that's about $164, $165 million. Relatively small percentage of the, of the total plan. That yellow bar represents what we call the normal cost, which is the value of benefits that the active population is going to earn in the, the, the current plan year. That purple bar at the top is actually future normal cost. So uh, many of the folks on the call are active, uh, uh, active participants with Metro or their uh, they have family members who are active population, that purple bar represents benefits that they are expected to earn in future years. So that's a portion that we're not really concerned about right now be, in terms of funding it because we'll fund those benefits when we get to those years. So while that's a portion of the total present value of benefits, it's, it's not something that you're trying to fund right now. It's something that you know you'll need to fund in future years but don't have to fund right now. So when we look at the, the calculating the contribution for the plan, it's really going to be that yellow bar, the 57 million, which is the value of benefits earned in the current year, and then an amortization uh, component for that $165 million unfunded liability that you're trying to slowly reduce and keep small. A couple more slides on uh, the, the population of the plan. And this slide eight is, it's, it's frankly interesting only because it's not very interesting. Uh, what this is, is a 15 year history of the average age for the general government and fire police population, general government in red, fire and police in blue, and also the average past service for the general government employees and the fire and police employees separately. So what's interesting here is that over time, over this 15 year period, the average age of the population isn't changing very much at all for either group. So it's not as though, so what we're not seeing here is we're not seeing our, our active population getting older. We're not seeing more longer service employees or more shorter service employees. It's ten, it tends to be very stable. So yes, we're having older, longer service employees retire Everyone else who stays in the population gets one year older, one year more service, and then new folks with no service and, and younger ages come in. Uh, I'm sorry, was there a question? Oh. Uh, one other thing you'll notice about this is while the fire and police tend to be about five years younger on average than the general government, uh, they actually have a little longer service, which means your, your typical fire and police member are being hired at a younger age than your typical general government employees. And that may be partially driven by uh, more mid-career or late career uh, hires in the general government area who, who tend to be older uh, with, with obviously no service, uh, while that's not as common on the fire and police side. Um, also, the fire and police being younger on average, that is one of the desired characteristics of, of the plan in general. You, you want a younger uh, fire police population because those are, are much more strenuous and, and physically demanding jobs. Uh, so you want a younger population there. Um, and, and so the pension plan in general is designed to support that with uh, younger potential uh, retirements for fire and police compared to general government. Also a higher benefit multiplier for, for, the, for many of the years, which allows them to accumulate a, uh, a, a uh, a benefit over a shorter career. On the next slide, this shows a 20-year history of the disabled population of the plan. And um, 
this is a you'll you'll see a general trend down on the on the disabled population, which really is a result of the return to work program, uh, which I don't know if any of the, the 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 HR folks on the call would like to speak to. But this is a program that has been enacted. I'm not sure when it was enacted, but the uh, general message of the of the graph here is the return to work program has worked incredibly well, uh, certainly over the last ten years, uh, in reducing the number of folks who are going on disability status and or uh, helping those folks get back to work and being removed from the disabled status. So certainly that program has worked. One, one interesting comment, you'll see a, a slight uptick there from 2008 and nine to 2010. Uh, disabilities tend to be very much related to the state of the economy. If the economy tends to be bad, dis disabilities tends to rise. Um, and, and so that's the, the likely result of the, the bad economy in 2008, 2009 being reflected in a slight uptick in those number of disabled in 2010. Okay, on slide 10, this shows the calculation of our recommended contribution rate. Uh, and this shows both June 30, 2019 and June 30, 2018. Uh, again, there's three components, the normal cost, which is the value benefits earned during the year, the amortization of the unfunded liability, which for our purposes, this is an amortization over a 15 year period. So we take that $164, $165 million unfunded liability and calculate a 15 year amortization of that amount. Uh, and that is uh, a portion of the contribution for the current year. Interest is added at uh, one half of the uh, half year's interest at uh, 3.75 or uh, one half of the 6.7.25% annual interest rate. And so the total contribution is $76.9 million. Comparing that to the payroll for that year of 638 million, that gives us a, a what we call a baseline recommended rate of 12.057% of payroll. You'll notice that's very similar to the prior year, 12.106. Uh, and so for both years, the rate approved by the board was 12.340%, which was uh, keeping it at a, at a consistent rate for the last several years. Okay, when we when we look at the value of assets of the plan, we really measure measure it in two different ways. We measure it as uh, market value, which is just the the, the snapshot value uh, of the assets as of June 30 of each year. But we also calculate what's called an actuarial value of assets. So for all of our calculations, we actually use that actuarial value of assets. Uh, it, well, the difference between these two is the actuarial value of assets averages in gains and losses over a five-year period. Uh, the reason we do this is that market value tends to be volatile. And as you'll, you'll remember earlier, I said one of the desired characteristics of the contribution is that it is reasonably level and reasonably predictable. If we were to use the market value instead of the actuarial value where we smoothing gains and losses, that contribution rate would be much more volatile and we would likely create some challenges in being able to, to predictably fund the plan because that contribution rate um, would, would jump around fairly significantly from year to re year just chasing those, those recent, uh, recent changes in market value. Uh, so the green line represents the actuarial value, which tends that you'll, you'll see in the graph has much less volatility than the red line, which is the market value. Uh, another interesting uh, point on this graph is the last few years, really, from 2016 forward up to the right, uh, the market value and the actuarial value are very close together. The markets have been fairly, uh, fairly smooth the last few years with only relatively small deviations between uh, our actual and expected. A return of about 7.25%. So as a result, there's not a significant deviation right now between actuarial value and market value, which is a good place to be. A little bit, of, a few comments on the historical return. So our average return since July 1 of 1990 was 7.65%. Um, so over that 30 year period, our average assumed return has been 7.86. You, you'll, you'll notice that I mentioned we're currently at 7.25. We have been at 7.5 for part of that period, and the early part of that period, we were actually at 8%, as many, most pension plans were at that time. So we're slightly below our expected return over the last 30 years. Our highest annual return uh, was 20.6%. Our lowest annual return was negative 21.4% uh, of those, and I guess I have 29 years here. We were above the expected 
um, 19 of those years, below expected 10 of those years. Uh, when we are above the expected, the average amount above is 5.9, and when we're below, the average amount below is 10.4. So what's what's interesting about that is is when, when we're above, we tend to be a small amount above, but those bad years, uh, it, it tends to be much, much below our expected return. Uh, the best five-year period was 14.9% for the, the five years ending June 30, 2000. The worst five years was 1.2% for June 30, in period ending June 30, 2012. So even in the worst five-year period over the last 29 to 30 years, it was still a positive return, although a very small positive return and more than 6% below expected during that period. Uh, so really, of all the all the material I have here, this is probably the most important one for, for your purposes. And this is just the, the historical funded ratio of the plan, kind of showing where, where we are with the plan. Uh, so as of June 30, 2019, the current funded ratio on a market value basis was 97.1%. Uh, that is a very healthy funded ratio, very close to 100% and a, and a good place to be. Uh, on an actuarial value where we at, at yet have uh, some unrecognized gains. So market value is a little less than actuarial value at that date. We were 95.5% funded, still a very good place to be. And if you'll look at that history going back to 1991, uh, the blue line represents the actuarial or the funded ratio on an actuarial value, and the red uh, indicates funded ratio on a market value. So here again, you'll see the value of the actuarial value of assets. That blue line has much less volatility than the red line. Uh, on that actuarial value basis, we have been above 80% funded every year since about 1992. So that is a, a very good position for the plan to be in, and, and the plan has a good track record there. On, an, on, a, on a market value basis where we're, we're not averaging in gains and losses, we've been anywhere from about 70% funded at 2009 after the, or 2008 after the worst of the, the financial crisis. Uh, we've actually been at or above 100% funded on a market value basis a couple of times during those periods. Uh, but you'll notice even those, uh, those couple of points around 1999 and 2006 where we were at 100% funded, the actuarial value was a little low because we had some asset gains at that time that we knew would probably be balanced out with losses in coming years, and, and they, they tend to be because you'll notice each of those couple of times where we hit 100% uh, funded or more, within two or three years, we were back below 80% on a market value basis because good markets tend to be followed by bad markets. But again, on an actuarial value basis where we average in those gains and losses, looking more at the long term than the the immediate uh, position, uh, that funded ratio really bounced around mostly between about 85 and 95 percent through most of that period. Uh, but the last several years from 2015 forward, we've been at 95 percent or so on, on a funded ratio. Uh, and this actually shows the last four years here, uh, a funded ratio on a market value and actuarial value basis. So again, largely uh, above 95 percent on an actuarial value basis each of the last four years. A little more volatility on the market value, a high of 97.1, a low of 92.5, but still a very good position to be in. Uh, so on slide 15, a little bit of information comparing where the Metro plan is with, with plans in general. And this information is from the uh, NCPERS uh, Public Retirement System Study in 2018. So the 2018 funded level of plans averaged 72.6%, uh, 2017 a little worse at 71.4%. So in general, Metro is about 20% above the national average uh, funded plan of public sector plans. A uh, little more information again from that 2018 NCPERS study. Uh, this shows based on the size of the population on, on the lower axis, uh, the, the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, axis, axis being the uh, funded ratio where you want to be is certainly above the average on this. Um, and again, while there are a few plans up there uh, above 100% funding, there are very few. Metro tends to be right here uh, with, a, with a total of about 25,000 participants and above 90% funded. So uh, in a very good position, certainly for, uh, for the larger plans. Okay, uh, this, this graph is intended to show the impact of investment return 
on the contribution ratio, contribution rate of the plan. The blue line represents the contribution rate. You'll notice out here to the right, we're very level, uh, been right around 12% for the last several years. But prior to that, we did have some volatility. Going all the way back to um, 1997, the rate was just above 10%. It has been as low as, a, as below 6% at the year 2000, and that was uh, one of those points where we were above 100% funded on a market value basis. Um, so that was really our, our low, but you'll also notice the cyclical nature of the markets here. Those green bars represent where we have been above our expected return, the red where we have been below expected return. So uh, the earlier point of when we, we, when we are above, we are a little above, that's obvious here. And also the point of when we are below, we tend to be very far below. Uh, you'll see that there with the, the big losses in 2001, 2002, and also 2008, 2009. Uh, but really the last 10 years have been relatively less volatile, uh, some mostly gains, uh, but also uh, some, some, some losses in a few years there. The rate has been as high as about 18 plus percent back in 2012. That was at the point where we had recognized all of the losses from 2008 and 2009. After that, we had gains to recognize, which began to push the, the contribution rate lower. Uh, so again, over this 20 plus year period, we've been anywhere from about 6% to 18%. So right now we're kind of right at our, our, what we would expect to be our long-term average of right around 12% with relatively little volatility in that rate. Uh, on the next slide, this shows the impact of or our deviation from the cost of living adjustment. So we've been in an extended period of a low inflation environment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a number of the things are different between divisions A and division B of the open plan. The cost of living adjustment is one of those. Uh, so on this graph, I've, I've shown the deviation from expected uh, on the cost of living adjustment. So maybe focusing on the lower, lower graph. Uh, for this 20, uh, 26, seven year period, we've only had four years where we have been, below, uh, uh, the actual cost of living adjustment has been above expected. Most of the rest of those years, 20 plus of those years, are the, the actual cost of living adjustment has been below our expectation. And that's even though we've been slowly lowering the expectation of the plan. So this is something, uh, while the participants would not be happy uh, of this history, and I'm, I'm sure they're well aware of it, they, they know that inflation has been low and the cost of living adjustments have been low. But this has been good for the health of the plan because it means uh, less money is required than expected to fund those benefits. So I've got a little bit of information here on contribution rate trends, uh, really showing three scenarios, our baseline scenario of the expected 7.25% return, and then also if we are 1% above that and 1% below that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we average is it, averaging gains and losses over a, uh, a five-year period. And right now, the actuarial value of assets is a little below the market value because we've got some gains that we haven't yet recognized. Uh, these four columns show when we're going to recognize those gains. And those gains total about $50 million. We're actually going to recognize at June 30, 2020, a small loss of about $1.17 million. So that should work to push the rate up a little bit at that time. But then we're going to follow that by three years of gains that we're going to recognize. And that should help push the rate. I'm going in the wrong direction. That should help push the rate down as we recognize those gains. Now that's assuming everything else happens exactly as expected, which we know never does. So there, there will be other gains and losses that, that may offset or add to these numbers. So on uh, slide 21, this shows the impact or the expected uh, trend of the contribution rate. So right now we're starting at around 12%. Uh, if we hit our 7.25% rate for the, for the current year, and we uh, recognize that small loss, we'll see a very small uptick in the rate, followed by a decline in the rate. This is on the blue line as we recognize some gains. And then the rates will begin to move back towards the long-term uh, trend where we are right now. If we actually only have a 6.25% return for the current year, uh, then we're gonna see a, a greater uptick, uh, but still, eventually moving back towards those long-term long -term trends. Uh, similarly, if we have a greater than expected return, the, the rate's gonna fall a little more, but again, begin to move back towards the, uh, the long-term trend rate of around 12, 12.5%. 12 
Uh, on slide 22, this shows, it's intended to show the impact of our investment return assumption. And it's very likely over the next few years that we're going to continue to lower that investment return assumption that currently at 7.25. Very likely at some point or soon, perhaps at our next experience study, we'll move that down to 7%. So this shows the impact if we were to do that. And, and it's really showing it under two different, uh, two different scenarios. The blue line represents if we move our assumption back up to seven and we keep it at seven, and the actual return is at seven. We're going to move up to, to just over 14%, and it will begin to drop slowly just below, to just below 14%, which will become our new long-term trend rate of, of about 13.8%. If instead we keep our assumption at 7.25, but we actually only earn 7% in all future years, the rate will start right where it is now, but we will begin to slowly move up to that new long-term trend rate because we're going to each year have losses on the investment side that we have to recognize. And that's naturally going to move that contribution rate back up towards the same place where we'd be if we assumed 7.0% uh, discount or 7.0% investment return. Uh, moral of the story here is, is that whether you assume it now or reality forces you there, you're ultimately going to get to about the same point. Um, if you're not getting the actual returns that you're expecting, your rate's going to rise uh, to, to make up for that. Okay, so this shows the um, the funded recommended funded ratio for the plan. Our recommended rate is the 15-year amortization, 12.057, although the rate, we've been keeping the rate level, that's by decision of the benefit board, uh, and we think that's a prudent decision because over time we do expect the rate to, to potentially rise, certainly with market volatility. Uh, so the extent we can keep it at that 12.34, I think that uh, that serves the purpose of keeping the rate level, but it also has the benefit of uh, building up somewhat of a cushion that can help uh, in later years if the contribution rate does rise. As I mentioned earlier, there's also a state law minimum, which is the normal cost plus a 30-year amortization of any unfunded liability. So that's a little less than what Metro is actually contributing, which is a good position to be in. Uh, and then lastly, at the top, the Metro code actually specifies its own minimum, which is uh, the normal cost plus interest on the unfunded liability. And so that would be an even smaller number at 11.083%. So again, before I move on to the guaranteed payment plan, uh, key messages on the Metro Open Plan. The Metro Open Plan is very well funded, 95% plus funding over the last several years. Uh, contribution rates very level. The plan is very well funded relative to its peers uh, around the country. Uh, if you do compare Metro Nashville to the TCRS plan, TCRS is one of, if not the best funded state plan in the country. And so it's at a similar similar position to Metro's plan, ninety five percent plus funding, I believe. So, um, so very comparable to the TCRS plan, which again is a well funded plan, but in a much better position than its peers around the country. Kevin, this is uh, Trish Holiday. I thought before you move um, to uh, to the next piece, could we stop and ask the committee members if they have any questions? Uh, up to this point, just because this is so much information. Would you be yeah. okay with that? Absolutely. Okay. Committee members, um, do I have anybody that would like to ask some specific questions about what's been covered to this point? Uh, this is Dick Chapman. I have uh, several questions. Okay. On page three, you mentioned the COLA provisions. What are the... What's the max on the colon? and how is it determined? Oh, great Sorry. question. Uh, I'm going to take Division B first, which is the, the, the larger group. Yeah, you can focus on B almost exclusively because A is a closed group. Okay. Um, the COLA for Division B is 80% of the CPI in excess of 1% rounded to the nearest one-half of percent, and it has a 5% cap. Now, as you might imagine, in a low inflation environment, uh, so, so I'll, I'll walk you through an example first of, of how that might work. So let's say the, uh, the, actual, in, the actual cost of living adjustment is 2%. So you take 2% and subtract 1%, multiply that by 80%. So you, it would be 0.8. So that gets rounded 
actually up to one. Mm -hmm. So it'd be a 1% COLA for that year. Uh, but let's say the CPI, uh, and we've seen this in some recent years, is maybe 1.2%. 1.2% uh, subtract one, you get 0.2, multiply it by 0.8, you get 0.16. It rounds to zero. So if you have inflation uh, uh, just over 1%, it is not, um, you're not going to produce a COLA for Division B. Um, if, uh, on the other hand, uh, let's say the inflation is 3%, which is very close to a long-term long -term inflation, uh, you subtract one, you get... Uh, Two multiply that by 0.8, you get 1.6. That rounds to 1.5. Uh, so, in really in in high inflation years, I'm going to move to um, move to slide six or 18 here. So you'll see many years here in Division B, where because of the rounding, we're either going to be at one, you know, 0.5, and this is actually the deviation from expected. Um, so in our expected currently is 1.25. So uh, we were, I believe, 0.75 below at that time. So the actual uh, inflation, the actual increase was 0.5%, um, a half a percent, which I believe it has been for a couple of years. I think that's also the rate for the upcoming year as well for 2021. Okay, another question. Um, this is Dick Chapman again. How are investments handled? Who, who does the investing in for the for the accumulated funds, um, the just so you know, my frame of reference is the state government. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm thinking TCRS has an internal staff plus some external contractors. Yes, and and any of the uh, uh, HR finance folks on the call want to help me? That's I'd, I'd appreciate that. But my my. Uh, my belief on this is that it's the Metro Treasurer's office. Uh, they oversee external managers who, who manage the assets. And that, uh, I think the point person there is uh, Fadi Busamra within Metro. Okay. Kevin, this is Shannon. I feel like that's a pretty accurate, accurate representation. Yes. It's under the office yep. of the treasurer. But to your point, we do manage external consultants that are professionals that do this. Mm -hmm. This is Nikki Eke. I just wanted to add that investments are under the jurisdiction of the Investment Committee, which is a separate uh, board that oversees and makes decisions ultimately pertaining to investments of funds. The Investment Committee is made up of the Director of Finance and the three members of the Benefit Board uh, that are appointed, uh, the three private members that are appointed. This is Dick Chairman again. On page six, you dealt with the population in the retirement plan. Mm -hmm. Does this, do those numbers mean there's as many inactive members, that is retirees and vested waiting to draw benefits as there are active members? Well, there are there are as many combined receiving benefits and waiting to receive benefits as there are active members. That's correct. Okay. Yes. And that's not too uncommon. Actually, um, you know, if you kind of think about the typical lifespan of an individual, many folks retire 60 to, to 70, live 20 to 25 years after that. So that is as long as... Uh, well, what might be a long working career for an individual. So it's not uncommon to see a pension plan where the number of inactive members is, is significantly higher than the number of active members. Uh, on, this is Dick Chapman again. On page eight, you had the pattern of ages and length of service for fire, police, and general government. I'm assuming from what you said, this is the set of patterns that you would expect given the nature of the job, the structure of the retirement benefit, particularly for fire and police, you want them to come in when they're young and leave when they're not too old, that kind of stuff? 
Correct. So those are the patterns you'd expect, and obviously they've been very consistent for Metro. Correct. Although I will say, when I put this this graph together, I, I I thought I might see another trend, which is something we see in the overall economy of folks working longer. And I, and I think we do still see that. I just don't think it is enough to to be reflected currently in older average age and and older average service. Yeah, some of it might also be that you there may Metro may be spinning off some activities as well. Correct. And I will say that's that's another, uh, certainly when we're talking about the av active population versus the inactive population, that is something we've seen as well. The active population has been fairly stable in number of, of participants, number of active members yeah. for, for a number of years. Now, there's some other things behind that, uh, to, to your point of, of maybe folks who have been Metro employees in the past that those are, are now those have been moved off of the plan, such as um, some of some of the hospital groups. Uh, but it's perhaps also a trend of just Metro being able to, um, to to keep the population stable and not have to grow the population with uh, as the community has grown, frankly. Right. You got frozen number of positions. Co correct. So, this is Dick Chapman again. That's all I have. Are there any other committee members that have questions before uh, Kevin continues? This is, yeah, this is Nick. This is Nick Brazel. I'll just have uh, one question. Uh, so as I understand it, the most recent valuation has not been completed, correct? The, cr correct. The most recent valuation that is completed is June 30, 2019. Uh, the June 30, 2020 valuation will be completed over the next couple of months. Is there any kind of, just really because of the timing, I, it not being on a calendar year basis and given what happened with investments uh, in March and not having all that time to recover, mm -hmm. just is there a preliminary understanding of how how that might impact the funded level? Right. And I, I should mention that when we do, for example, the 2020 valuation, that those results are usually communicated in January. Uh, that forms the basis of what Metro contributes for the upcoming fiscal year, July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2022. Uh, but a key, a key thing we do each year when we present valuation results is we take a current measure of assets uh, and then do build that into our projection of where we think the, trend, the, the rate is going to go in the, in the upcoming years. Uh, because we average averaging gains and losses over a five-year period, uh, Short-term investment results don't significantly drive the rate, but over time they will, because over a five-year period, if, if the plan, uh, you know, for example, if the plan loses uh, $200 million in investments to, uh, investment value today, and that sticks through the next valuation, not all of that impact is going to hit us immediately. But over the next five years, all of that impact is expected to come in, and that will, will move the rate at that time. Okay, thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions from the committee before we move forward? All right, uh, Kevin, uh, continue then. Thank you. This is Trish Holliday asking for continuance. Thank you. I'm going to move back. Okay, on slide 24. So. Uh, Metro and Metro Public Schools have five old, closed, and frozen pension plans, and they are the Metro Teachers Retirement Plan, a former city and county teachers plan, and a former city and county employees plan. So some of these plans actually date back to 1963, I believe the year is, when, when uh, uh, Metro and Davidson County formed the, the Metropolitan Government. And so uh, these plans, some of these plans have been what we would call pay-as-you-go plans. Uh, so there wasn't necessarily a trust fund set aside to pay these benefits as we're doing for the open plan. Metro would just pay for the benefits each year as the, the participants were due their benefits. Uh, but, uh, in 2000, the uh, Metro Code created the Guaranteed Payment Plan, or GPP as we call it. It's in Section 2.24.470 of the Metro Code. And the purpose of this plan was to fully fund these benefits in a systematic manner over a period of 30 years. Now, at that time, on July 1, 2000, 
the status of these plans was we had assets of 105 million and all of that was in the Metro Teachers Plan, which was is the largest of these five plans. Uh, the liabilities of these plans were 444 million and the annual benefit payment was 44.4 million, the annual benefit payments for all five plans. Now for comparison purposes, currently the Metro Open Plan pays benefits of about $177 million. So this was, was much smaller and this was 20 years ago also. Now the GPP established annual funding uh, for these plans, for the guarantee payment plan at $33,577,294. And what happened through most of this period is, is this money came in, first went to pay benefits for all of the plans other than the Metro Teachers Plan that had a trust fund, any remaining amount would go into that trust fund. Um, and if there wasn't, if there was no additional amount, then the Metro Teachers Plan paid its benefits out of the existing assets at that time. So a little more information about these plans. Uh, the number of participants, and this is a, a, a number as of June 30, 2019, we're now down to 1,369 participants in all five of these plans. The annual benefit payments are now 29.9 million, and the average age of the folks in these plans is 82.6. Now, these plans have, there is, I think in the Metro T, the Board of Education plan, there is one deferred vested participant. There are no actives remaining. Everyone else is retiree, and as you see by the ages, the, the, the group is, is, is quite old on average. So this is on slide 26. I know this isn't a very attractive graph, but I pulled it exactly from one we did 20 years ago. So that's, this was state of the art 20 years ago. Um, this shows the projected benefit payments, contributions, and the fund balance for the plans as a whole. So what was expected to happen over time is the benefit payments in red, those fall. The green represents the contributions coming in from the guaranteed payment plan. Uh, the blue shows the trust fund. So the trust fund was expected to be to uh, fall because we had more benefit payments than contributions throughout much of that period. And it was expected to reach a low of around 20 million uh, right now, frankly, 2019, 2020. And then as the benefit payments fell below the amount of contributions, the trust fund would rise. And at that point, all of the benefits would be fully funded by this trust fund that had been set up and no future contributions would be needed or required. Uh, but moving 20 years or 19 years into the future to see where we actually are. So uh, that middle column shows where we were projected to be um, at, uh, at 2019 when we were looking, when we we're standing at the year 2000. We expected benefit payments to be at 33.9 million. We expected the plan liabilities to be at 262.6. Assets of, as I mentioned earlier, right around 20 million. And so we still expected to have 243.4 million of unfunded liability, but about 11 years left in payments to, to fully amortize that, that liability. And I should also mention uh, the three teacher plans actually get some state funding uh, for a portion of those benefits. So all of these numbers are, are a net of the state funding uh, for these plans. Now, if we look at where we actually are 2019, the actual benefit payments are just under 30 million at 29.9. The plan liabilities are a little below where we expected at 229.2. So really both of these two numbers, the payments and the liabilities are about 10% below expected. Where that really comes from is uh, the cost of living adjustments. That was one of the key factors because uh, 20 years ago, virtually all of these folks were, were inactive as well. So the cost of living adjustment was, was really the key variable for this plan. Uh, and, and cost of living adjustments have been below expected for, for much of the last 20 years. And so that, that reflects in lower benefit payments currently than expected 20 years ago. Uh, also, the plan assets are now 111.6 million, uh, much higher than what we expected 20 years ago. Again, that's really due to a couple of factors. It's due to, um, again, the benefit payments being, being below expected. But um, if we look at the, 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 the asset return history of the plans, while the, the plan has, the trust fund has had um, the, the same investment um, environment that everyone else has dealt with, for much of this period, the plan assets were relatively small compared to the liability. So the plan did not have a lot of investment return exposure. Um, 
So now the remaining unfunded liabilities of the guaranteed payment plan is about 117.6. So if we look at, at the expected amortization period, how many more payments of 33.577 million it will take to fund these benefits, we think it's now four years. Uh, so we've been able to trim off a number of years through good experience uh, on, on that, um, that total 30 year period. Mr. Sullivan, yes. I, I, I'm, I don't understand the point here for this slide. Is the 2019 projection assuming um, Section 2, 24, 470 of the Metro Code was not adopted? Or was the projection um, assuming it was adopted even with the uh, um, systematically funded amounts over over the five plans, you were still projected in 2000 to have um, the 243 million of unfunded liabilities. Can, can you That's yeah, yeah. You're you're exactly correct. This this is with the guaranteed payment plan implemented. Uh, it was expected all along that we would see this trend of the, the assets fall and then rise through the last few years of the guaranteed payment plan. So. We, this is the middle column there is where we expected to be at June 30, 19, when we were, when the plan was implemented 20 years ago. We expect it would take a full 30 years of these payments to pay off those benefits. Okay. And kind of the, okay. the, the, the moral of the story of this slide is, is that things have turned out much better than expected over the first 20 of these 30 years. And, and uh, as a result, we don't expect uh, another 11 years of the 33 million will be necessary to, to fund these benefits. So it's a much better, from the plan's perspective, a much better picture than what was expected. Can, can I ask you under the Metro code that created the GPP, does that, get, given the actual 2019 status, does, does that, does the code allow Metro to reduce the funding it's making um, over over the remaining four year period, or or, or however long is left, that, actually that, another twenty years. Yeah, that that I don't or, know, um, and that may be a question for for Nikki or or, or someone else. Here's this is Dick Chapman. Here's a separate question: Could the Plan liabilities be, um, or the remaining unfunded liabilities be one recalculated and two um, spread out under an, another amortization period longer than the four years remaining on the original amortization period. Hey, from from the standpoint, assuming that there's no. Uh, um, uh, statutory reasons that you couldn't change the terms of the GPP. I think any of those things are, are possible, either um, extending the amortization period, which would, which would change the amount. Um, you know, my, you know for, from our perspective, minus doing any of those things of changing the amortization period and changing the amount, uh, the funding reaches a point in about four years where it's it's no longer necessary, and so any remaining funding coming in would would in fact overfund um, the the these five plans. Now that's that's, um, and I will say e even if four years from now we think that the assets and the liabilities are perfectly matched, uh, just as I mentioned earlier with any plan, you're going to have gains and losses over time. So the plans may in reality be slightly overfunded, slightly underfunded. Uh, but at that time, um, and the plan's going to progressively shrink year by year because you've got a, a population that is Fixed. older and it's getting, the group's getting smaller. So that risk reduces with each passing year because the, the absolute amounts just get smaller and smaller. Uh, but there is still some risk that you, you're, you, you do need to contribute more at a later time. Um, okay, let me, let, 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 let me ask it another way and try to pin you down on perhaps a potential recommendation coming out of this group, given um, the, the effect of the Metro code that created GPP has been very successful, how do we help Metro find a way 
to extend or change the Metro Code, what change to the Metro Code, Mr. Sullivan, could we potentially recommend that would allow Metro right now to decrease the annual funding to take advantage of this improved performance? Well, assuming there's no statutory or, or, or legal uh, hurdles to that, I, we could certainly recommend a number of things. I, I think uh, even extending the amortization to uh, perhaps the expected future lifetime of the, of the plan, something like that, it, maybe extending it to 10, 15, 20 years would reduce the, that payment considerably. So I think there are a number of, of things that, that uh, a number of alternatives we can suggest. Also, it's there is the, the option of continue to make those payments for the next four, five years, whatever it takes to fully fund the plans, and then uh, effectively shut off that funding. Kevin, this is Ginger. Could you then take that funding? I, I don't know if it'd be a code change or whatever, but once the four years it was paid off, take that funding and then put it toward the, the current plans to pay down that liability? I think so. I, I mean, that, that, that again may be, uh, that's kind of outside of my, my area of expertise, but from, from a, the standpoint of the money was expected to be needed for these plans, it's clearly not right. needed. Uh, that, that money can be, you know, reclaimed for other other purposes. Um, okay. Mr. Okay. Sullivan, we've got Metro in a pinch right now. And one of the goals of this committee is to evaluate these plans and see if there are some changes that can be recommended. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be very helpful if you could assist us in understanding what changes to the Metro code we could recommend out of this committee that would let Metro reduce the annual funding requirement now under this GPP, given it's in a pinch, mm -hmm. uh, and take advantage of this very good performance overperformance we've seen. Um, so is that something, Mr. Sullivan, you you can do? Yes. Uh, okay. OK, this is Nikki. Okay. I just wanted to indicate that um, I will also look at the laws that govern the GPP uh, to and then provide that information. Um, to Mr. Sullivan and, and to the committee. Kevin, this is Dick Chapman. Um, on the GPP, do you do, um, will you do another analysis of this as part of the 2020 evaluation that you're working on now? Yes. So we could ask you, for example, to look at uh, maybe two or three amortization period options when you do the calculation on the GBP to basically tell us what the annual payments would be required using the normal set of actuarial assumptions on, you know, on the characteristics of the group, which you know is a fixed amount, I mean, fixed characteristics and under the, the normal um, interest rate assumptions Mm -hmm. And those kind of things so that, you know, right now you've got an 11 year amortization and an annual payment of $33.9 million when about $30 million for four years is going to, according to the calculations you've got here, is going to fully fund that particular um, requirement. Right. Correct. Correct. Okay. And, and, one, and one thing we'll want to um, we'll want to make sure of when we do these calculations is make sure we don't reduce the amortization so much that we we, we affect it. And that's why the average lifetime of this population is important in this calculation. We right. don't want to make the, the the assets go negative before they pop back positive. We don't we don't um, want to put put too fine a point on it. But for example, you know, if, if you could free up some money 
in the annual metro budget, given the, you know, the the current revenue picture and those kind of things, that might make a little sense. Yeah, yeah. Particularly Absolutely. if you know if you got if you're if you're if the graph that preceded the chart uh, is even close to what's going to happen from the benefit payment standpoint, um, you know, the the blue line has occurred earlier than you thought it would. C correct. Correct. It, it, you know, the, the, the actual assets did drop down for much of this last 20 year period, but it never reached uh, anywhere near this level that we, we thought it would 20 years ago. Yep. Well, yeah. that's the, you know, that's the problem with being the actuary for that long. You have to live with your results. People actually get to see, people actually get to see what happens. <laughs> But you could you could always say you know it's your predecessor's fault. Uh, I, I I reserve the right to fall back on that. Thanks. Uh huh. But yeah, I I, I, I will mention this, and this is maybe one 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 of the. Uh, the challenges in implementing this is that th there are five plans here, and and three of these plans I think are are, are technically board of education plans, and are overseen by a, a separate benefit board on on the board of education side. So I don't know if 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 that requires some additional coordination, um, but um, the the. the the underlying message here, though, is still the same regardless of, of who has responsibility for it, is that at, at some point, these payments are not going to be necessary. So either the payments are going to need, need to be cut off in about four years, or we're, we're going to reduce need to reduce the amortization, reduce the payment, and, and extend it for a, a, a slightly longer period of time. Do you, do you, this is Dick Chapman, do you know the actuary over there? Uh, yes. Okay. He's, he's, he's in our firm. Our firm does all the actual. Oh, okay. Actual yeah. yeah, I'm, you know, and the other thing is if Metro doesn't send the Board of Education the money to fund it, they're going to have to make a change themselves. Correct. This is Trish Holiday. Kevin, I think we could um, continue through with this. And then before we move to our next agenda item, I want to ask the committee about timing. Okay, well, I think I'm really at the end. The only thing here on this last slide, I think your points I've already covered uh, through the discussion, which are, you know, uh, the plan, even after we're fully funded here, the plans will continue to have some gains and losses. So there may be some some small additional contributions that are required uh, at some time. Or there's also the possibility that uh, when these plans are fully, uh, when, when all of the benefit payments are made from these plans, there's still assets left within the plan. So, um, and your primary sources of gains and losses are going to be investment gains and losses. Uh, certainly as the plan becomes closer to fully funded, that's that's more of an issue. Um, but really the only other, the only other variables here are the participant and beneficiary mortality and the cost of living adjustments, which, uh, the cost of living adjustments certainly have been below expected most of that period and mortality. We've probably, again, some of these, some of these folks are teachers within the teacher's plans and teachers tend to, to have a very long lifespan relative to general population. Um, but even within that, I think there's been some gains on the on the mortality side with folks perhaps not living as long as we've expected. That gives brings me to the end. Thank you very much, Mr. Sullivan. This is Trish Holiday, at, and uh, thanking you for your time. And committee, do we have any uh, further questions for Mr. Sullivan at this time? Well, great job. And we have one more uh, item on our agenda for today. It is 11.32, so I want to check with the committee members. Are you, could you just give me a visual thumbs up that you're ready to continue? That would be great, Cleo. I like that thumbs up. 
Kim got it. Nick, where are you? Are you giving me one? There it is. And then Dick, are you there? Did you give me one? Okay. Well, uh, Justin, if you'll set us up for the next item on the agenda. Thank you. This is Justin Stack. Uh, if you could change the presenter role to Kelly Lewis. And for item number three, titled Healthcare Strategy Recommendation to Address OPAB, uh, we have Angela Lewis here with Deloitte to present. Thank you, Justin. This is Angela Watts with Deloitte. Good morning to the committee. I may want to start by asking a question along the lines of what Trisha said, just as a time check. How much time do Kelly and I have? 26 minutes? Just want to gauge how quickly I need to speak. Yes, uh, 26 minutes. And this may be an item that we continue over. This is Trisha. Uh, yeah. We may take this to the next committee. I don't want to okay. rush through it, and I want to make sure people have enough time to digest it and get through it. Yes, I, I agree. Thank you, Madam Chair. I this just like pensions, uh, health care coverage is very near and dear to Metro employees' uh, hearts and pocketbooks. So I want to make sure we give appropriate time and attention to the materials that we've here. So let's go ahead and get started. And Angela, this is Trish Holiday. It might be that you want to just figure out today what's a nice piece for us to look at. And let's go ahead and plan for that next to move it forward to our next so that we can continue it, but don't feel rushed. So that's up to okay. you. Okay. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. We do have we do have a recommendation at the end. So I would like for us and for Kelly to share that with you uh, before we do end so that the committee can be thinking about that and potential questions. And that might be a good place to start for the next session. Uh, so that will be our, our goal. Uh, I do believe I'll be brief in the background here. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and get started. The purpose of this meeting uh, and this topic goes back to the Kevin Crumbo uh, statement and discussion that he had with the committee just after the memo that was issued by himself and Tristan Wilson on September 25th. And in his remarks, he stated that the number one focus of the administration is on OPEB. Uh, and that liability is $4.2 billion as of July 2020. And very different to the pension liability that Kevin just told us all about, uh, which is 95% plus funded, the OPEB liability is unfunded, completely unfunded. It is paid as you go, paid year to year as we go. And this presentation is intended to address this uh, $4.2 billion liability. First, quickly, what is OPEB? Just to be completely clear on that, it stands for other post-employment benefits. The main component and ultimate driver of this liability is the retiree medical health insurance that, uh, that we have been discussing and that Christy Mayo touched on in her presentation earlier. Metro pays 75% of the cost of the retiree medical coverage with the indexed uh, premiums that she, she reviewed in the uh, change number three that was noted back due to the t uh, change in 2013, where it was the index scale. Also, dental insurance is included in OPEB, where Metro pays 100% for single coverage, and life insurance, Metro pays 100% up to $10,000 of, uh, of the benefit. So let's move forward, Kelly, please. Uh, next, so to put this discussion into further context, I'll go through this quickly. There were four items on the administration's memo from September 15th, some September 25th, excuse me, that dealt with medical care. Uh, and in that memo, you may remember, the first one was regarding making uh, recommendations around a lower cost employee health plan. Uh, there are two current plans and they're both platinum coverage, the PPO and the Cigna choice plan. Uh, 
through surveys that were conducted in 2019 of the employees, there's interest by lower paid employees and younger employees to have a lower cost option. We are currently presenting information uh, we did a couple weeks ago to the benefit board and all of this is being under consideration currently. And we can provide supplemental information to this committee at a future date. Secondly, uh, the, the second item was regarding retiree health plan options. And that's what this presentation today is about. The third item listed in the memo is regarding the uh, additional or optional incentives around uh, generations and tighter management of out of network costs. So two points here regarding generics. Uh, Metro's PPO plan has the Blue Cross Blue Shield has two tiers for drug copays. By that, I mean the plan has a $10 copay for generics and then a $30 copay for all other drugs. So the most uh, someone will pay that's in the PPO is $30 for any type of brand drug. Um, there's 85% generic utilization in that plan, which is slightly below Blue Cross Blue Shield's overall book of business. Uh, Blue Cross does offer several programs to help employers manage their overall drug spend. And over the last few years, Metro has implemented some of those programs, including an opioid management program. Then a Cigna Choice Fund, uh, that plan was designed to drive consumerism. It's a consumer-driven healthcare plan. Uh, the plan does not have co-pays for, uh, for these uh, generics, and the design does tend to result in higher utilization of generic drugs as a result of that. Their utilization in that plan is 92%, which is higher than Cigna's overall book of business. And then on out of network costs, not uh, not much to talk about here. Just two point four percent out of network for Blue Cross, BPO, two percent uh, for Cigna. Very small percentage are seeking care out of network, and that's a result of the the, the carriers having broad networks as a result of Metro's contract with them. So large networks of providers. Okay. Finally, the fourth item. This was around broadening the availability uh, and scope of wellness initiatives. We'll continue to evaluate these strategies uh, in the future uh, and can bring additional comments to the committee at a later date as time permits. Okay, so that's, we'll go jump back to, to OPED. So the strategy to address the OPED liability is centered around offering a Medicare Advantage plan as the sole choice for pensioners who are eligible for Medicare. Um, the currently Medicare eligible pensioners can select the Humana Medicare Advantage plan, or they can select either that PPO or the Cigna Choice uh, account-based plan. The issue, of course, is this $4.2 billion unfunded liability for OPEB. Um, this, the strategy around the Medicare Advantage plan and making it the only option will lead to savings, significant savings for both Metro pensioners and the city. So this is a win-win for both the members and the city while maintaining the comprehensive medical coverage, which the pensioners uh, have become accustomed to. The $14 million you see uh, on the right-hand side there, this is an estimate of the savings. If this strategy for a Medicare plan being the only choice for pensioners had, if it had been implemented for, 2000, uh, 20, for 2021, the upcoming year. So that's $14 million. And that's a minimum estimate of savings based on just the difference in the in the costs and the premiums uh, associated with the trans, we have more to share on that. Uh, but there would be actually more savings due to the plan coverages and co-pays and the plan designs that could be experienced by the uh, by the pensioners. We won't know the actual savings for um, 
for if this were to be implemented for 2023, which is the time frame we're talking about, or the potential time frame if this were to move forward, until we know what the the contribution of premiums are for the plans for 2023. But it's it would be this or better. And then at the bottom, I think the most powerful information here or result outcome here would be that that $4.2 billion OPEB liability can be reduced by $1.1 billion as a result of implementing this change, this strategy. So let's move on a little bit more. We have we have a lot of information to give you a full view, but let's, let's keep going and then we can, uh, as we said, we can dig in deeper if we need to at a later time. Again, there are three plans available currently. The Blue Cross Blue Shield PPO, it's fully insured by Metro. Prescription drugs are part of that program, which is part of this employee group waiver plan so that uh, uh, Medicare eligibles can have prescription drug coverage in the plan through Part D, Medicare Part D. The Cigna Choice Fund is an account based but it has an HRA pinch and uh, and then it's also self-insured by Metro. Pensioners with Parts A and Part B cannot participate in the HRA, I should mention, but they can continue to use any unused HRA funds that they may have accumulated over the years. The Humana Group Plan is the Medicare Advantage Plan that's currently available to Medicare eligible uh, retirees. It's a PPO plan with prescription drug coverage. It's not a Medicare supplement plan. It provides a combination of the members Part A, which is the hospital coverage, and the Part B, which is outpatient or medical coverage. It also includes other supplemental services that you would imagine uh, are, are very relevant and important here. Home health care, vision coverage, dental, transportation, the full suite. These are all three of these are truly plans and in the market. Uh, including this Humana Medicare Advantage plan. It is fully insured by Humana, unlike the other two plans, which are self-insured by Metro. Uh, one note here at the bottom, the, the employee group waiver plan, which was part of that PPO, we can talk more about this later, but was effective in 2014 to incorporate those prescription drug coverages in into the PPO plan. And that, uh, that language had to be incorporated in Metro's code. The reason that's important for the committee is because if this plan, if this strategy is implemented, that language will need to be cleaned up in the Metro code. Okay, Kelly, if you can move forward. Okay, here. Hey, hey Angela, yes. real, real quick, at some point, and maybe it's not in this meeting, um, assuming the Metro code does not change, how could EG WP be shifted to elsewhere or continue to be supported by Blue Cross Blue Shield. If you, if you could just give give us some alternatives to that, that'd be great. Well, sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Ms. Dag. The the need for me to language goes away because the Medicare eligible uh, pensioners would be in the Medicare Advantage, the Humana Medicare Advantage plan. So the need for that language is eliminated. So they're not, we're not, nothing would be taken away from anyone if the code change is made. Did that make sense? Because the, the language was added so that the Medicare eligibles could have prescription drug coverage in the PPO. But if all the Medicare eligible pensioners are in the Medicare Advantage plan, then there's no need to have that provision and language associated with the Blue Cross PPO. This is Kim Stagg, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, so current enrollment for pensioners, here it is. There are 6,400 uh, pensioners with Medicare, if you go to the bottom, <coughs> if you include their dependents, we're looking at 8,500. They're about 33%, the 2,100, that are in the Humana Medicare Advantage Plan. So only 33% Medicare eligible members are choosing to enroll in this plan. There's a lot of brand loyalty to Blue Cross Blue Shield PPO and the Signet Choice Fund, which is what's going on here. I say we the annual enrollment just ended for Metro and there was just a slight shift, but nothing to move the needle with regard to enrollment in the 
Medicare Advantage plan. You can see here the numbers in red, the premiums <clears throat> for those enrolled in the other two plans, uh, seven, over $700 less for the Medicare Advantage plan relative to the PPO and over $1,000 less. That's money that would go in the relative to the Cigna choice fund. And that would be money that would be directly uh, back into the pockets of the pensioners uh, in terms of lower, lower deductions out of their pension checks if they were to choose and, and only have a choice of the Medicare Advantage plan. Ms. Watts, help us d drill down I I into that. It, are people choosing Cigna and Blue Cross Blue Shield simply because of brand loyalty? Are yeah. there yes. better doctors in that net network? Is there more coverage? Is there better coverage? Um, no. I can tell Kelly's eager to jump in, so Kelly, <laughs> go for it. There's a lot, yeah. a lot of brand loyalty here. Um, hi, hi. Um, this is Kelly Lewis, and um, you are. It is not that the PPO, the Blue Cross PPO plan is better, or that the Cigna plan is better. It's just that uh, as employees, and they were in those plans for uh, some time. Some of these people have been in these plans their entire career at Metro. Uh, when they retire, they don't want to leave them. You'll hear them say, "Well, Blue Cross has been good to me." which is kind of an anomaly because it's really Metro that's been good to them. It's Metro's plan, it's Metro's plan design. Uh, Blue Cross is just literally paying the claims, um, but um, they, they, it is, that's what we mean by brand loyalty. Um, so, um, and, 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 and we are going to share here in a few more um, slides, um, a side-by-side -side comparison of the plan design, in fact, um, in almost all instances, it's really better in terms of coverage for those uh, pensioners to be in the Humana plan because of the coverage. And um, the one thing about Humana, if your doctor accepts Medicare and agrees to bill Humana, um, if they've been seeing that doctor while they've been a Blue Cross member, they should be able to see them while they're in the Humana plan. And uh, one thing to point out is, um, the both the Blue Cross and the Cigna plan. If you don't go to an in-network doctor, you have to go out of network and pay higher, and, and the plan pays higher. Uh, Humana, the um, all the benefits are the same in and out of network. Because once again, if a provider accepts Medicare and will bill Humana, they will accept this um, insurance. So okay, but, it's just a but, matter of but, but, but help us drill down into this about whether retirees are going to get less benefit if we go to only Medicare Advantage. No, they are not. What and if I think doctors don't accept Medicare, are, are, will, will they be at a disadvantage <clears throat> if they're in Humana versus Blue Cross? No, um, so one of the, if you are a pensioner with Medicare and the, P, and the Blue Cross PPO plan, uh, Metro's PO plan pays secondary to Medicare. So if you are seeking coverage from a provider and they won't bill Medicare, then um, your your PPO plan is not, not going to be, I mean, th th that wouldn't work. So Metro's plan, when the, the PPO plan um, is secondary to Medicare for those pensions. So... Uh, So I think we will, um, there will be a few more slides here that we will, you know, um, go through this um, item by item. And Chrissy Mayo, if you are still to tell the um, uh, in annual enrollment and other communications that uh, HR does is that um, they're not going to be losing anything. and. In, most instances are gaining a lot of extra coverage. Hey, it's Christy Mayo again. Um, I, I attend all of the annual enrollment meetings that we typically have in a year. 
And like Kelly and Angela was were saying, um, the, the pensioners do feel a, a true sense of loyalty to either Cigna or Blue Cross. And they will tell you over and over again, they've been so good to me. Blue Cross has been so good to me. They're afraid to leave um, because it's new and it may be a little uncomfortable for them. Um, but if they do come in person to a meeting, we will actually, I will tell them, please go sit down with Humana, go speak to them, um, you know, talk to them about the medications that you take, all the doctors that you see. And more than nine times out of 10, they come back and say, you know what, you were right. I, it's just a better plan. Um, Kelly mentioned that, um, the network is really large. And even if your doctor's not in network, you can still see them. Um, but they do, they just, I think it's just a sense of, of change. They're just afraid to make sometimes, but um, slowly they are getting there. So thank you. This Angela, I can't hear you. Let's see. Ah. <clears throat> yeah, and I wanted to let yeah, and I wanted to let the committee know I'm gonna have to leave in three minutes. So, because um, I have another call at ten. So, um, and I don't know where we are. We've got like six minutes left. So, okay. so we can keep going. Um, I know that we need to continue this at the next meeting. So, um, committee, thank you for your participation and all the presenters. Thank you all so much. Okay, thank you. So do we want to maybe, do we want to go to um, maybe the, I was gonna say Kelly, let's go to slide 12, just and spend 60 seconds on that. And then we'll get to the slide 14 with the recommendation for 60 seconds. And then we can, we can uh, absolutely, tee this back up next time. And I think that'll be, at least we bring some closure to the ultimate recommendation for the committee members. Go ahead. Okay. So um, on, let, let me go to actually quickly on lot slide 11, because I think that might, um, well, I guess it's because you've already covered that. So slide 12, this is just really showing that as Angela showed um, just a moment ago, um, if this uh, Medicare Advantage had been the only option for the pensioners in 2021, the pensioners would have had, um, you know, savings um, of about $663 if they moved from the PPO to the Medicare Advantage plan or over $1,000 if they had moved from the Choice Fund. To the Medicare Advantage plan. And as Christy may have mentioned at the start of today's meeting, the changes that Metro implemented in 2013 with the medical premium indexing, this Medicare Advantage plan is going to uh, produce more savings for those individuals as those um, provisions start coming into play. And what I've got here is an example uh, down at the bottom um, that if there was an employee that um, retires for 10 years of credited service that was hired after 21-1-2013, uh, um, they're going um, to be paying 75% of the cost of their health insurance compared to what current retirees are doing that are only paying 25% and Metro's paying 75%. If that pensioner had been in the, was going to be in the Medicare Advantage plan for 2021, um, and they've got to pay 75% of the cost of coverage. You can see um, that, um, that they would have saved, you know, almost 2,200 versus being in the PPO plan or almost 3,200 in the Cigna plan. And that's just a component of some of the slides that we had to miss, but the way Medicare Advantage plans operate and by being with a carrier that, um, you know, they um, CMS awards all of these Medicare Advantage plans with numerous star ratings. There's about nine categories and Metro through their procurement process, you know, they look to, to um, you know, procure a contract with a, uh, ensure that, you know, meets a lot of qualifi qualifications. So, you know, Humana is um, certainly one of the um, top providers of Medicare Advantage uh, plans in the market and has done extremely well the last few years. Uh, as Metro puts their plans out for bid here um, in the next 
year for a uh, contract rate from 2023 to 2027. It may or not be Humana, um, but, um, but what Metro will do is make sure that they are reviewing proposals and procuring with a, you know, a, a Medicare Advantage insurer that meets, you know, the highest um, star ratings and, and things like that um, from CMS. So I'm going to quickly go to slide 14 as we are with two minutes to go and just leave you with um, kind of the recommendations for you all that you can consider um, and we'll certainly revisit this. But two recommendations to help achieve uh, two of those top priorities that were outlined by Kevin Crumbo um, is to A, reduce the city's OPEB liability and find a way to migrate retirees to a plan that maximizes um, you know, revenue from um, CMS and Medicare, uh, which are Medicare Advantage plans. So uh, a recommendation for this committee to consider is effective January 1, 2023, which will be the start of when Metro's new five-year contract with medical carriers will you know, take place. Um, um, to make the Medicare Advantage plan as the only choice of health insurance that would be offered by Metro to pensioners that have Medicare. And if they're covering dependents, their dependents must also have Medicare. And secondary to that, if you decide to go with that recommendation, the following recommendation is just uh, would be dependent upon the first. And that is just literally kind of a code cleanup because no longer, as Angela was saying, if we don't have pensioners with Medicare in the PPO plan, then the employer group waiver plan language is no longer necessary. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, committee, this is Shannon Hall. Um, I just wanted to note that I believe our chair, uh, Dr. Holliday, had to drop off. Um, but, and I also um, would like the benefit of allowing the committee not only to kind of look at this, but also some of our viewing audience. So um, if it's agreeable, maybe for our next meeting, um, we can tee back up this presentation and kind of quickly go through those first handful of slides that Angela was able to cover in detail with Kelly. Um, and then kind of pick up so that you can see the benefit of uh, some of the proposals, because I do think this is going to be uh, in the long run, especially with cost share coming into play, a really meaningful comprehensive uh, tool for our pensioners to have comprehensive coverage without sacrificing inequality, save them money, save Metro money, save OPEB liability. So um, this is part of the low hanging fruit component that that we were interested in sharing with you because um, OPEB can sometimes have much tougher choices and we feel like this is a much easier path towards a meaningful reduction of that OPEB liability and might be part of this collection of strategies that help us not have to sacrifice any of that like some of our peers have had to do. So um, with that, I don't know if I wanna turn it back over to Justin or um, if Mr. Rucker wants to take over as vice chair, whichever you prefer. No, thank you, Fannin, for all that you added. Um, I'm free to turn it over to Justin, recognizing the time as well. Thank you, Mr. Rucker. Uh, this is Justin Stack again. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments based on the discussion that Deloitte just presented? I, just to make sure, is everyone in agreement with what Shannon suggested? as far as bringing this back to the next available committee meeting? Yes, I am. This is Cleo Rucker, I am as well. That sounds good. Perfect. Ms. Stagg, are you okay with? Uh... I agree we should continue on this topic in the next meeting, yes. Thank you, this is Justin Stack again. Uh, we will make sure and have this brought back to the next available meeting. Uh, before we uh, adjourn, I, I do want to make sure uh, Christina uh, has mentioned it. If you could send her your available dates for the, uh, the uh, month of December so that we can make sure and have uh, some additional meetings scheduled and put on the books, uh, especially due to the holidays. So I just want to make sure that uh, if you can uh, look at your calendar and, and provide Christina with uh, the dates so she can go ahead and get those scheduled uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so we'll have that done. 
Uh, let's see, is there any other comments or anything else that we need to uh, bring up at this point? Justin, this is Dick Chapman. Yes, sir. You may want to have somebody from Crumbo's office um, attend the next meeting because if we get to the point of talking about this in any serious way, um, based on some of my experience, this will not be an easy move. This is Justin uh, Spack. Uh, we, we will make sure and, and, and um, uh, put that on the record and, and uh, I'm sure Ms. Hall will uh, have that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, I, you know, I, she can, I, Ms., Ms. Hall can throw herself on the fire if she wants. <laughs> you, you know, if if I might add, uh, the OPEB liability is something we have to tackle. And Ms. Hall, I so appreciate that your group and others have brought to us something that looks very reasonable. I would challenge you to show us what the much more aggressive recommendations might look like um, so, so that it will help us understand why your recommendation is so reasonable. Does that make sense? It does, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm probably one of the largest cheerleaders for Metro's comprehensive benefit system. So I'll be honest with you, I don't have harsh recommendations <laughs> at all, but I think what would, to your point, um, really articulate and, and kind of demonstrate this experience is we can pull back in some information about what some of our peers have chosen to elect. Um, you know, I think I think for sitting in our seat, we realize we have a, a, a pretty decent liability because we have such comprehensive coverage, arguably the best in the state of Tennessee. Um, and certainly when we looked at, at peer coverage levels, most of our peers have plans that have meaningful deductible, deduct, deductibles, et cetera. Our plans are small if no deductible, right? So we already have generous plans to begin with, um, which is helping to drive part of that OPEB liability. And then, for example, the state of Tennessee at age 65, uh, you no longer participate in retiree coverage. So those are some of, I think, to your point, I think if we can articulate what some of our peer cities are doing, what others around us are doing, um, I think what our goal was when we were brainstorming is there's got to be a better path because if I were a pensioner, I would be really scared about some of the other paths that have been utilized. So this was us kind of getting creative in the space, talking with um, our consulting partners um, about how we could be meaningfully addressing the OPEB liability. Because if we don't do something creative in the space, we're not going to, the, the only the hammer will come later. And so we're looking to avoid those tough recommendations. So I think what we'll do is lean on our consultants and our actuary to help us kind of bring back some information about what others in the marketplace have done. Because when you look at what we're proposing here, um, this seems to be the much better and easier path and again, putting myself in the shoes that I'll one day be a pensioner as well. This is Justin. I agree Stack. with what you just said. Thank you. This is Justin Stack again. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, thank you to everyone for uh, your, your time today. I know everyone has busy schedules, so I appreciate it. And once again, if you can communicate with Christina on, on your available dates, so we can go ahead and get the next couple of meetings scheduled. But with that, uh, thank you to everybody and we'll adjourn the meeting. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.